Thanks to all the audience who follows our broadcast. We have the honor today of having Dr. Yuk Dufo. Dr. Dufo is professor and chairman of neurosurgery at the neurosurgery department of Montpellier University Medical Center and director of the team Brain Plasticity, Stem Cells and Diffuse Low Grade Gliomas at the INSERM at University of Montpellier. Today, at the 2021 IWBNC, Dr. Dufo is going to share a lecture on contribution of meta-networking theory of brain functions to low-grade glioma surgery, about over a thousand awake procedures. Please type write your questions in the Q&A panel. We will read them after the end of Dr. Dufo's intervention. Welcome, Professor Dufo, and thank you. It's all yours. Thank you for your kind invitation and giving me this opportunity to share my uh, 25 years experience in this field of uh, wake mapping for low grade glioma surgery based on a better understanding of the connectome. I will not uh, insist on the fact that for a long time, uh, uh, many neurologists and neurosurgeons uh, thought that uh, localizationism uh, was the absolute truth regarding brain processing. And finally, definitely, uh, we demonstrated that uh, uh, localizationism should be burned which is very important for patients with this kind of tumor, because that means that, of course, uh, they can have a, a very important invasion of so-called eloquent areas, especially here, the left frontal lobe with uh, the involvement of uh, broker's area without any troubles. And this means also that thanks to mechanisms of neuroplasticity, it's possible to achieve a, a very extensive realization of uh, these tumors and uh, uh, to preserve the quality of life or even to improve the cognitive assessment of patients thanks to postoperative cognitive rehabilitation. So we have, first of all, to understand brain processing, to be neuroscientist, to participate in the, the elaboration of new models of connectome because we are connected to the brain. It's our responsibility as a neurosurgeons, and we have not just to remove the tumor. With 25 years of follow-up, I can say really that we increased both survival and quality of life. And to achieve this goal, first of all, we decided to do earlier surgery, even in incidental low grade glioma. So definitely no wait and see attitude for more than 20 years in my experience. Second, maximal resection, and I will reintroduce the concept, of course, of supratotal resection, because we know that there are tumoral signs beyond what uh, we can see on preoperative MRI. And third, the safe resection, definitely, we have to better understand the connectome of this patient at that time. And then uh, to do a maximal resection according to the functional boundaries in the vast majority of cases in patients who are young, who enjoy normal life, who work full time, and uh, nonetheless with some seizures allowing the discovery of uh, uh, this uh, tumor, which is not benign. I'm sure you have understood that now this uh, low grade glioma will become high grade in all cases and finally will kill the patient. Be objective by doing uh, an extensive cognitive assessment before any treatment at diagnosis. And then you will see that patients are not so well. And of course, it's impossible to adapt the intraoperative mapping and the postoperative cognitive rehabilitation if you have not understood that before surgery, these patients had already some degrees of cognitive deficits. These deficits are not related to the lobar location of the tumor, Broca's area, Vernicus area, and so on. They are related to the invasion of the white matter tract because the connectivity in the depth is the limitation of neuroplasticity. We have to understand that, especially as neurosurgeons. And of course, when uh, uh, the neuroplastic mechanisms are totally overcompensated, then that means that the patient will have seizures. Very quickly regarding the oncological issues before surgery, you have understood that, of course, uh, if the tumor is bigger, then the prognosis is worse because the risk to, in, to have malignant transformation is higher. So that means in practice that our goal is to decrease the volume and then to decrease the risk of malignization. Of course, if a tumor is growing faster, then the prognosis is worse. 
is just an evidence. But the reverse is true. If a tumor is growing slowly, the prognosis is good. You will tell me just an evidence. Yes, but it's independent of the molecular pattern of the tumor. We demonstrated that many years ago. That means that a tumor IDH1 Y type can evolve slowly. And just now we say, so the prognosis is good. So we have not to give, in all cases, adjuvant treatment like chemotherapy or radiotherapy according to the molecular biology, which is just a part of the story. In other words, in my experience with uh, Y-type astrocytoma, after, of course, an extensive resection of the tumor, if the tumor grew slowly before surgery, we will not irradiate. We will not give immediate chemotherapy. And you can see the survival, which is over 80% after seven to eight years of life. When I started, uh, uh, when I, um, I was younger, the median survival, uh, uh, especially by applying the wait and see concept, just a biopsy, uh, just a small position, uh, uh, chemo radiotherapy and so on, was six years to seven years. Now we decided to be objective by doing volumetric assessment of the tumor, not only before surgery, but also after surgery. And that's crazy because it's not done in the vast majority of trials. So that means that evidence that's seen, forgotten to take into consideration the most important parameters in low-grade glioma, namely the extent of resection. Indeed, when you do uh, early and extensive resection, then suddenly the median survival is more than 15 years in prospective study, what we demonstrated a few years ago. And it's possible because I have the habit to reoperate, as you will see, not only twice, but also third time now, because I have more and more fun up. And each time you decrease the volume of the tumor, each time you decrease the risk of malignant transformation, and then you increase the median survival. And recently we reported with my friend, Luc Taillandier, your oncologist in Nancy, and that uh, the median survival in our uh, a common series uh, was over 16 years of follow-up, but with the vast majority of patients continuing to enjoy normal life uh, over 12 to 13 years. So that means that it's not just overall survival, but also quality of life. And how to achieve this goal once again, by removing the vast majority of the tumor, yes, but according to the individual functional boundaries. So we have to understand the brain processing and the human connectome in this patient at that time by doing mapping. When I was younger, I say that uh, this tumor located very uh, frequently in uh, Broca's area, SMA, Insula, uh, Vernicus area, around the system. That's true, but it does not mean that this region are eloquent. Definitely, localizationism does not exist. So that means that in this connectomal view of brain processing, and definitely demonstrated because I have more than 99% of reliability when I perform this kind of surgery, then suddenly you can use fMRI in order to help you to better understand the principle of networking brain. And I am PhD in this field. I like to continue to say that because now I will tell you never I will use fMRI into the operating theater at the individual level because I understood the limitation of fMRI and DTI and there is no value at the individual level. You can see the sensitivity and specificity when compared with the intraoperative mapping, so the absolute truth. This is true also by using the new methodology of fMRI resting state. This is also true with DTI. The reliability is only 80 to 85 percent. So, of course, as a didactic tool, as a research tool, it's beautiful. But at the individual level into the OR, there is definitely no value. If you do not believe me, please read this paper written by a specialist in this field four years ago. And they concluded that the tractograms contain many more invalid than valid bundles. So definitely no for the clinical application. Yes, as a didactic tool and research tool. 
So into the OR, please awake the patient. And what will happen suddenly, you will be able to do the mapping at the level of the cortex, but also the white matter tracks the limitation of neuroplasticity accurately. And by doing online anatomo functional correlation, so guiding you in order to better understand the connectome and then finally to push the resection by uh, being sure at least 99% that the patient will return to normal life. Indeed, we will adapt the task into the operating theater a la carte according to the lifestyle of the patient, job, hobby, habits, leisures, and so on. And I received patients from five continents and I had to adapt to their culture, to their expectation, wishes, and so on. In other words, to avoid hemiplegia and aphasia is not enough. My patients need more. They want absolutely to return to an active life, speaking about the socio-professional issues. And this is the reason why I have also to take into account their environment, because if you have an hemianoptia in France, you cannot drive. If you have an hemianoptia in North Africa, you can continue to drive. So the medical legal issues are not the same. I gave uh, recently uh, a talk uh, in New York and I said, mm, you will have some problems. I know that. To rehabilitate your patient following surgery because uh, uh, um, socio-economical parameters, namely, they are not uh, reimbursed. While in France, you are reimbursed uh, uh, um, and then uh, uh, you can increase uh, the level of recovery regarding the cognitive functions. Definitely also, we have to take into account uh, uh, the connectivity in the depth, the projection fibers, the association fibers, uh, when you will push the resection until this white matter tracks. I published recently a paper in Acta Neurochirurgica in order to explain to neurosurgeons that whatever the lobar location of the tumor here, as you can see in so-called Broca's era, here in the parietal lobe, here in the temporal lobe, Whatever this location, you should be into the contact of the dorsal phonological pathways at the end of surgery and then to induce some phonological disorders when you will stimulate. So you will not do a specific battery of tasks according to the lobar location because in all cases, you will be into the contact of the same connectivity. So this is the reason why in my operating theater for more than 20 years or so, definitely I would not use technology because I know that technology does not work with 99% of reliability. No microscope, no DTI, no fMRI, no, no, no neural navigation, no intraoperative MRI, no robot. You can do it everywhere in the world. Nonetheless, with your knowledge of the functional anatomy of the brain, the collaboration of the patient and a good team. This is the reason why I cannot understand why your surgeons continue to speak about the dominant hemisphere and non-dominant hemisphere. I need both hemispheres in order to operate an insula while I am right-handed. Of course, we have also to weigh the patient in the so-called right non-dominant hemisphere because this hemisphere is critical for complex movement, not just to avoid to be hemiplegic, to be a surgeon, to be a golfer, to be a pianist, Spatial cognition to drive, social cognition to continue to have normal relationships with the environment and others. Executive functions, working memory, multitasking, but also your personality, your emotional processing. How do you want to map it under general anesthesia? Be honest with your patients by telling, I will not do that, but I will not promise that you will return to normal life. I will just avoid hemiplegia. Okay. And you will tell me, you think that really you can monitor these kind of functions into the world. And I will answer you, of course, I know that we can do it because we did it for more than 15 years by asking the patient to do two tasks simultaneously, by introducing semantic association tasks, but also mentalizing tasks, namely theory of mind. And then based on these observations, we published already seven years ago in brain, the fact that Broca's area does not exist. And we proposed a new model of connectivity of language. And finally, recently, 
I was so amazed by the fact that many neurologists publish paper in 2021 in brain to explain that Broca's area was not the area of speech production. Really, what a scoop. And we publish a reply by telling your surgery, say that so far before. So that means that you will adapt the tasking into the OR according to the expectation of patients. For instance, the patient is a mathematician, you will introduce a task of calculation in addition to movement and language. The patient is a dancer, you will introduce a line by section task, even in the so-called right non-dominant hemisphere, and so on and so on. But in all cases, we are human beings. Your surgeons have difficulties to accept that we are, first of all, emotion. It's true for us, it's true for our patients. So we have to monitor mentalizing, emotion, social cognition, theory of mind. You can use the word you want, but it's possible. And it's possible not only definitely at the level of the surface, but also the wide matter tract. If I speak about the posterior limb of the internal capsule, and if I cut it, I'm sure that everyone will understand that patient will be hemiplegic and will never recover. But it's not enough. If you are a pianist, as I say, if you like sport, if you want to continue to operate by yourself because you are a surgeon, and I operated on many surgeons in my life, then we have to preserve a network involved in coordination, motor control. And it's true at the level of the cortex, but also the why matter tract by understanding that we have to monitor the frontal striatal tract and the frontal astron tract into the why matter tract. Except if the patient tells you, it's not really an issue for me and I want to live longer and it's not really a problem if I am not hemiplegic, but uh, if I cannot play piano, okay. So you adapt really the extent of resection according to the needs of the patient. Same thing regarding the somatosensory feedback. You cannot monitor the somatosensory reaction, but also the bodily awareness in a patient under general anesthesia. And if you have this kind of problems, the patient will have some difficulties to run, for instance. Once again, if you induce EMI and Optia in France, and I'm sure in many countries, you cannot drive. So you cannot say just my patient is well because speaking, talking, and moving. No, he wants to enjoy a perfect normal life. This is true in the right non-dominant hemisphere, speaking about how to avoid hemi neglect by preserving the part two of the superior longitudinal fasciculus. Never the neural navigation will give you this kind of information because it doesn't know that. You have to know by yourself that. Same thing regarding the dorsal pathway. Definitely, Broca's area is not connected to Wernicke's area, but mainly to T2 and T3. So when you will stimulate, you will induce conduction aphasia. So the patient should be awake, whatever the location of the tumor. We have seen that previously. But there is a ventral semantic pathway. Once again, if you operate a tumor within the frontal lobe, the insular lobe, the temporal lobe, you have to weigh the patient because you will be into the contact of the IFOF in the end and you will induce semantic paraphasia. And at that time, even if there is a residue, according to your beautiful intraoperative MRI, you will say, and so what? I will not cut the IFOF because the patient would like to return to normal life. Same thing regarding the ILF, the inferior longitudinal fasciculus. You have to know that it's critical for reading in the posterior part and involved in naming in the anterior part, but it could be compensated thanks to the IFOF. Explain me why you can cut the anterior part of the ILF, the temporal lobe and the uncinate with a compensation by the direct semantic pathway and the patient will nonetheless recover after a very extensive left temporal lobectomy, for instance. But the price to pay will be to have an increase of reaction time regarding the lexical access. And you have to say that to the patient, to be honest with him, her, before surgery. And then he will decide if you can push this resection according to his expectations. You have not to decide for him if we can live with an increase of reaction time. You have to ask him. 
in the right non-dominant hemisphere, I have the regret to tell you that if you cut the right eye off, you will induce semantic disorders. You will tell me, yes, I have many patients. I did that. The patient is moving and speaking. Yes, but the patient has cognitive disorders regarding semantics. So it could be a problem to return to normal life. Same thing regarding definitely mentalizing, what means in practice, you have to ask to the patient to recognize the emotion expressed by faces, eyes in front of him or into the war. When you really stimulate patient, if at the level of force of the network involved in the mentalizing, will have some disorders like uh, uh, telling this is happiness for sadness. And this is true at the level of the cortex, but also at the level of the right non-dominant I4, right non-dominant singulate and so on. And I know that because during my first 10 years, I have induced modification of the behavior of the patient, even if they were able to move and to speak and according to the classical results to, ex to be exposed to neurosurgeons, my patients are well, but in practice, it was not so true. But now, yes, because we introduced this new task, and because as neurosurgeons, we are also neuroscientists and we participated in the development of new model of cognition and more you understand the brain, more you have good results and more you can push the resection into the brain. This is the paradox, but in fact, I will demonstrate to you according to my results that more you preserve the connectum, more the median survival increased because we have to deal with brain plasticity. And because we have to understand that when we will remove a low grade glyomine patient enjoying normal life uh, at diagnosis, even if the cognitive assessment is in fine not perfect, it changed, she changed already the brain by increasing the volume of the contralateral homologous. For instance, in the insula here, you have an insular tumor, the contralateral insula increased the volume, but also increased its connectivity, functional connectivity. So, of course, this is the reason why you can do a transcortical approach to remove the vast majority of the insula, and the patient will recover if you preserve the connectivity in the depth, namely the I4 running and the temporal stem, so lateral to the anterior perforating substance. And at that time, it's very exciting to use fMRI, which is in a sense non-invasive, before and after surgery in order to understand how patients after SMS and room can recover thanks to both hemispheres. What means dominant hemisphere in this patient? It needs right and left in order to compensate my cavity and explaining why it recovered. But now, remember, I told you, I can increase the median survival. It's not my imagination in, anymore. Now I demonstrated that by doing a second and a third surgery, knowing that in the meantime, there were some mechanisms of additional neuroplastic potential occurring between both surgeries. Here, the knob of the hand, and finally, I was able to remove the vast majority of the precentral gyrus, but of course, by preserving the connectivity in the dead, and you can see the results in a patient able to play guitar, or the um, vernicus area with a still eloquent cortical areas during the first surgery. I said, okay, I will wait. And I came back 10 years later, and in the meantime, the patient continued to enjoy normal life. And of course, now in the second time, you can see that I preserved the ILF and the junction with the arcuate fasciculus and the I4 dorsal ventral semantic pathway. Now you have understood that if you cut this pathway, you will not cut five more millimeters. You will disconnect two thirds of the hemisphere. Never your patient will recover. And this is true at the level of the so-called broca's area. Sometimes, of course, I stimulated the parser opercularis in the left dominant hemisphere, and the patient had problems. In this case, semantic problems. I am not crazy. I did not uh, uh, remove broca's area a priori because I wake the patient in order to say, stop according to functional boundaries, but I will come back. And this is the point. Surgeons would like to believe on the fact that if you left a residue, then the patient will live mm, mm, not so long. But in fact, if you came back, then you will increase the median survival. 
and in the meantime, mechanisms of neuroplasticity induced by post-operative cognitive rehabilitation. And then suddenly you can remove the so-called brokers area and you can see that I preserved the connectivity again in the tech and the vessels. So you can do it also sometimes, and you see it's very impressive even for me to be able to do a bilateral frontal lobectomy, but this patient benefited from five hours of cognitive assessment, can drive, can continue to work, to take care of his children and so on. But I did both lobectomy with 10 years of uh, uh, um, um, waiting 10 years in the meantime. So the results, my first 850 diffuse low grade glioma patients, just speaking about diffuse low grade glioma. So more than 1,200 in fact awake surgery in these specific indications. I do not speak about glioblastoma today. Then in so-called eloquent areas, Verdicus area behind the uh, labeven, Broca's area, parietal lobe, insula, uh, uh, corpus callosum, Rolando, and so on. Mortality zero. I cannot lie because 90% of my patients are coming from abroad. 0.5% of severe permanent deficit related to deep stroke when I was younger. I have not understood at that time the fact that the right eye forth protected me, functionally speaking, of the perforating arteries, anatomically speaking. And in the past 15 years, I understood that the rate of stroke zero. 25% of improvement. No, before you cannot remove broker's around to be better after surgery while you were, you were perfect before surgery. You were not perfect. Please show me the preoperative cognitive assessment. And you will see that in the vast majority of cases, patients are not so well. So you will do a postoperative cognitive rehabilitation and objectively, three months later, they will be better plus 80% of positive impact on epilepsy, especially if you remove beyond what you can see on the MRI because you have understood that uh, uh, epilepsy in the gray glioma is not related to the core of the tumor, but the periphery. So more you remove, more you will increase the median survival by avoiding malignant transformation, more you will avoid or control seizures. So there is no dilemma. You will increase both quality of life and median survival. And now I will publish paper very recently in a, a journal uh, uh, of neurosurgery, very soon, I mean, not yet published, but uh, with, uh, for the first time uh, uh, in the literature, a subgroup of low grade glioma operated on first time, second time with mechanisms of neuroplasticity, third time with new mechanisms of neuroplasticity. So each time I increase the median survival by increasing the extent of resection while preserving the quality of life. And you can see the median survival, almost 18 years. So to incorporate additional data into the operating theater based on a better knowledge of the connectome is not against the quality of life, is not against the overall survival, but improved both. We demonstrated that. In the wound series, median survival is 17 years. So I'm sure that Mitch Berger, uh, told you that uh, if we can do that in San Francisco or Montpellier, you can do that everywhere in the world. And it was the goal of uh, this meta-analysis uh, we did all together a few years uh, uh, before by telling, of course, if you wake the patient, of course, if you use intraoperative mapping, and of course, if you do a resection guided by the function, then your patients will be better and live longer. Especially if you do a supratotal resection, because definitely, stop to think that the flare hyper signal is the disease. This is the reason why intraoperative mapping, in, I'm sorry, intraoperative mapping is critical, but intraoperative MRI is dangerous because sometimes you will cut some pathway in the depth involved by the tumor. And because of the intraoperative MRI and your patient will not completely recover. And sometimes it would have been possible to remove more and you stopped according to the imagine by Italy, I removed the flare. Yes, but if you can remove more, but according to what? According to the functional networks, what kind of task? What we have seen, multitasking, nonverbal semantic association task, mentalizing, naming of course, and so on and so on. 
Yes, but why to do supratotorization? Because we have more than 15 years of follow-up, the rate of death in this subgroup is zero. The rate of malignant transformation in this subgroup is zero. I did not hear that, but I avoided malignant transformation and not against their quality of life. So you will tell me, yes, but it's difficult to do supratotorization in all cases. Of course, if we are seeing the patient too late. So this is the reason why I propose to operate earlier, including with incidental discovery. Why? Because once again, please take your time if you uh, uh, have some patients with incidental uh, low grade glioma to do an extensive neuropsychological uh, examination at diagnosis. And you will see that uh, in 60% uh, of cases, they are complaining and in uh, one third of cases, they have already objective deficit of cognitive functions. And of course, you cannot see that by just uh, doing a clinical examination. You need to be more objective. So according to that, we decided uh, to do surgery. And in my experience, over 100 patients with incidental low grade glioma. And of course, I increased very significantly the rate of total and supratotorization, namely more than uh, 60 to 70 percent with no partial rotation and no permanent deficit. And of course, also increased the extent of rotation, so the median survival especially because they were already malignant foci in the middle of the tumor in one third of patients. This is the reason why also we published that it was exceptional to induce any seizures following surgery in patients with incidental low grade glioma, so it was not an issue. We recently published in journal near surgery, not only the cognitive scores before, but also after surgery in order to be totally objective and the, most important, definitely, is quality of life. What means for these patients who, in the vast majority of cases, are young, they want to return to normal life and especially to work. More than 97% of our patients are able to work following surgery. So this is the absolute proof that it's not just we avoided hemiplegia and or aphasia. I can really tell them you will return to a perfect normal life. And this is the reason why we proposed a policy of screening the general population in France four years ago, and I started to operate patients with intentional discovery of a possible low-grade glioma because they decided, for instance, to do an MRI because their father died from a glioblastoma. You can achieve this kind of results, not thanks to technology, but thanks to your knowledge of functional anatomy, and especially not only plasticity, but the limitation of neuroplasticity, the minimal common brain, the skeleton of the brain. If you cut it, you know that patient will never totally recover. And it's very important beyond surgery for low-grade glioma, high-grade glioma, but also for a uh, surgical approach of a deep lesion, for epilepsy surgery, for BCI, if you would like to restore the brain, how do you want to restore the brain for younger people and the next generation if you have not understood brain processing? The problem is that, that radiotherapists have not yet understood brain processing. And then I have the habit to deal with them in my patients after doing this kind of uh, mapping a la carte. I will tell them you will not irradiate basically because this is a wild type uh, as I demonstrated to you if uh, the growth rate was very slow before surgery or to apply um, the Buckner uh, all while uh, in fact, you remember that uh, they use only a minimal mental status examination which is initially designed for dementia and just five years. But I'm not speaking about the next five, for, uh, five years for my patients. I'm speaking about the next 20 years. They are living longer. And evidence based medicine demonstrated that early radiotherapy did not increase the median survival. It's not my imagination. It was published in Lancet. They are published that there was a decrease of the cognitive functions, but beyond five years. So we have to anticipate that. We are not speaking about patient who will live for two years. So radiotherapists have also to understand the limitation of neuroplasticity because when they say oh, we use technology like neurosurgeons uh, thanks to intraoperative uh, MRI, and now I can focus radiotherapy, 
Yes, but if it's the crossing fibers between the dorsal phonological pathway and the ventral semantic pathway, I can tell you that a few years later, the patient will have cognitive disorders because they radiated the minimal common brain. So what to do in these cases? Chemotherapy, because we have more than 15 years of follow-up and we know that no delayed cognitive disorders. And you will tell me, yes, but uh, it's not an oligodendroglioma. And so what? At the individual level, no value. You can see here, it was a beautiful shrinkage in an astrocytoma, white type. And then it gave me the opportunity after this shrinkage at the level of the minimal common brain to reoperate and to do supratotal resection and to increase the median survival while preserving the quality of life. So we proposed another organigram with my friend Luc Layondi by telling please operate earlier maximally according to functional boundaries, induce plasticity by doing postoperative cognitive rehabilitation, come back, you can nurture them, come back a third time if you can, otherwise do chemotherapy regardless of the molecular, molecular pattern of the tumor. And finally, we will irradiate. But in my experience is in the vast majority of cases after 10 to 15 years, so definitely, it's not against the quality of life of the patient, but it's not against the median survival. Show me in the literature a paper demonstrating more than 16 years of survival. And I will be a little bit more provocative, even if there are some foci of maglin non-transformation, I mean three or even four, but just in the middle, of course, of the tumor and not everywhere. And if you did, a complete resection, and if the tumor grew slowly before surgery. In these cases, and we published this paper one year ago in urology, the five-year survival rate with only surgery and not post-operative uh, uh, chemotherapy, and of course, no radiotherapy in order to preserve the quality of life in the next, next future, you can see 95%. Typically here, it's really high grade glioma. You can see the enhancement. I did the surgery almost 20 years ago, no chemotherapy and radiotherapy. I did a second surgery four years ago. At that time, according to the new classification, it was a low grade glioma, where it was a high grade glioma 20 years ago. But of course, it was just a focus, no chemo and radiotherapy. I'm not crazy. We can change radically the natural story of the disease by preserving the quality of life for patients. And definitely, I will re insist, our responsibility is to participate actively in cognitive neurosciences by proposing new models of cognition because we are the soul to be directly connected to the brain. fMRI and DTI are beautiful, but this is not the truth, just biostatistics. We are the truth. We are into the contact of the truth. Nonetheless, we can combine longitudinally and definitely, I like to do fMRI before and after surgery. And uh, um, talking again about the ASMS and room, we have understood that the patient had a transitory deficit related to a decrease of the connectivity between both hemispheres. Once again, what means dominant hemisphere? We need both for this patient to recover. And then with a re-increase of inter-hemispheric connectivity, the patient recovered. And it's true for movement, but also for language. Beyond that, it's necessary when you remove a part of the language network for the rest of the language network and the preservation of the deep connectivity, of course, to be more connected to other networks, especially involved in cognitive functions, such as uh, um, working memory, attentional processing, and uh, mental flexibility. This is the, uh, the message of this slide. So, interactions between networks, network of networks, meta network. And this is critical in order to preserve higher cognitive functions like attentional processing, like knowing of knowing. In other words, in order to give you the opportunity to know what you would like to be, to do within the next 10 years and not just tomorrow. And to do that, you need, of course, to have more abstraction in your brain, if it's true for us as human beings. Otherwise, you cannot make long-term project. It's true for our patients. They have one generation now in front of, that, uh, of, of them. I mean, uh, to decide to have a baby, for instance, or not, 
or to buy a house and so on. So recently we reported in a scientific reports a new task we introduced into the orb without increasing the number of stimulation, without increasing the duration of stimulation, four seconds, without increasing the median of uh, median duration of surgery. And the goal is just for the patient to evaluate if he thinks his answer, her answer was good or not. One, I don't know, six, I'm sure. And so sometimes the patient, when you stimulate, can tell you happiness for sadness, for instance, six. So he was not able to recognize that he made a wrong response. So that means that you cannot enjoy your normal life because you are anosognosic. To help younger people, we model the sole functional atlas in the literature, cortically and subcortically speaking, regarding the real function and the critical networks. And this is the reason why we published it in your image and not in Journal of Neuroscience, because it's also valuable for neuroscientists. And that means that for neurosurgeons, if you have this atlas in your mental imagery, you know the minimal common brain. But to help you, we developed recently uh, software in order for you to match this atlas with the MRI of this patient. And of course, before surgery, but not during surgery, because it's just a probabilistic atlas. And during surgery, you have to check at the individual level due to the anatomofunctional inter-individual variability by awakening the patient and doing online intraoperative cortical and subcortical mapping. And then for you to understand and to try to see into the operating theater, not only one network, and of course, not just one area, definitely localizationism does not exist. I'm sure I'm convinced about that. But also interactions between networks and between both hemispheres. So how do you want to do a wing mapping here just for language, which is just a small part of the whole meta network and to not awake in this hemisphere because in the right. <laughs> Your patient will not be hemiplegic, but that's it. Please show me your results. 97% of patients return into a normal life with almost 18 years in front of them. And we understood definitely also that uh, there are a mix interaction changing online, not only into the operating theater, but within the brain, because this is physiological in order to adapt to the environment. And this is the concept of meta network. Modification, constant modification of the equilibrium within the central nervous system. You will tell me, oh, it's too esoteric, it's too neuroscientist, it's too, no, no, no. Now you are into the operating theater. You ask to the patient to do movement and naming. You see two very easy tasks. You will see that uh, in many cases, the patient, of course, cannot move anymore or cannot speak. But sometimes patients can do movement, can do language, but naming cannot do both simultaneously. And then you will tell, I can continue because he can speak, he can move. Yes, but your patient will not be able to continue to preserve his cognitive function. We don't care. The patient is not hemiplegic aphasic. You do not care. What about the patient? and not three months following surgery. I continue to follow them. And I ask the question to them and their family, five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years after surgery. And now you know if it was a good idea or not. Just to conclude how I do it, because I have maybe five more minutes uh, in this uh, medical doctor resident uh, who had the uh, incidental discovery of this typical log ray lemma involving a little bit the temporal lobe, but uh, most of all, of course, the so-called Broca's era and the insula. So I have the habit to operate on the lateral position by doing probably a wider bone flap than Mitch uh, in order to have a positive mapping in all cases. So clearly the rate of seizures Inducing the uh, abortion of surgery, speaking about more than 1,200 uh, surgery, zero. Because I use very low intensity, because I have a positive mapping in all cases, because I do a wide urban flap. 
And I know that the output is not Broca's area, but the ventral premolar cortex at the level of the lateral part of the prefrontal gyrus. So inducing an artery. Okay, I understood. Good intensity between two and three milliamps is enough in 95% cases, no seizures. And now you can administrate the naming task. Now you can administrate uh, the semantic association task with uh, at the level of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and that broker's area directly some semantic disorders. Now everything is clear, five minutes in order to do a cortical mapping, no ECOG, no uh, uh, intraoperative MRI, I have good glasses, and then I can do the surgery while the patient is doing dual task by alternating from a naming task to semantic association task, auto-evaluation task, you have understood. So you have to go fast and you will see that uh, I will not coagulate anymore except at the level of the cortical surface because I knew that it was a true negative mapping because here it's a positive mapping. And now I will do a sub pial dissection without any coagulation. So no split of the sylvian fissure in my experience because I am not a vascular surgeon, I am brain surgeon. So I have to remove brain tumor, so I will go to the brain. I will do a sub dissection without microscope, so no coagulation because no bleeding. You put a cotton, you put surgicel, it's enough in 99% cases, including high-grade glioma because in a high-grade glioma, I do a lobectomy around the enhancement and not uh, doing a debulking within the hands match. So here, this is the same goal, to go to the sylvian fissure, so no bleeding, no spasm, I insist, no papaverin in my operating theater. And then finally, more or less in 15 minutes, it's very quick, you will have an exposure, very good exposure of the insula. You cannot yet see it, but you will in now five minutes. Of course, I uh, refer all the tumor, the whole tumor to uh, the lab. So that means that I'm not against uh, a neuropathological examination, molecular biology and blah, blah. Simply it's one parameter, not the absolute Bible. Now you can see the surface of the insula with the cortex, with uh, the superior circular sulcus. And what I will do is to put the retractor at the level of the insula surface in order to do sub from inside. So that means that, once again, no direct contact with the vessels. The vessels are protected by the pia matter and within by retractor. And of course, what will be the danger by doing that? The deep connectivity. And because I will be infinite to the contact of the temporal stem in the end, so the eye froth, so I will induce semantic paraphysia and I will stimulate at that time. You can see that I do not coagulate, but I do not stimulate. Why to stimulate? The patient is giving you the absolute truth because he's continuing to do the tasks online. And I know where is the IFOF. The IFOF cannot be above the insula. Of course, in essence. So you have, first of all, to remove the insula, what I do now in front of you, without microscope, without bleeding, just with a retractor. And now be careful about the ventral semantic pathway. If you don't know your functional anatomy, you will be lost. If you know it, you will stimulate semantic paraphysia. Okay, I will stop it. Yes, but maybe there is a residue. Of course, there is a residue in the anterior perfecting substance, but I will not cut the eye off because this guy is a medical doctor and he told me I want to continue to enjoy perfect normal life. Okay, I have understood. So subcortical stimulation, uh, semantic paraphysia. Okay, I have understood. I reached the functional boundaries. I have understood the connectome of this guy at that time. So I will stop. Post-operative MRI, I removed the so-called Broca's era, which does not exist. I was really into the contact of the lateral part of the lentiform nucleus and the IFOF at the level of the external capsule. And of course, I left a small but objective residue, which was expected at the level of the anterior perforating substance because this patient is now a medical doctor. So the conclusion, 
is very easy. If you know the brain, you can operate the brain beyond the gray glioma. But speaking about the gray glioma with 99% of reliability, you can triple the median survival. You can give them one generation. So please be connected to the connectome and forget technology. Otherwise, you will have a risk to be addict, especially for younger people. Because if you start to use systematically in your navigation or intraoperative MRI, one day it will be broken and you will not be able to operate. So now you have the choice just to be an oncologist by removing a tumor and uh, referring the patient to your new oncologist and that's it, or to take care of the patient of a human being by understanding is her connector and giving him her the opportunity to enjoy a perfect normal life for one generation. So if I can do it, you can do it. Please be first of all a neuroscientist and it's very easy after that to operate the brain and to remove a tumor. Thank you. Thank you very much for such a wonderful lecture it was truly enlightening and enthusiastic, Dr. Defoe. Uh, I am sure all the audience has learned from your robust experience. Uh, right now, we have a few questions from the public. Um, Dr. Benavides from Colombia, what do you think about the frontal Aslan tract? Is it possible that it be resected? Of course, you can reset what you want, but you will induce a decrease a slowness of the initiation for speech. And sometimes you can induce a, a, a stuttering. I mean permanent stuttering because I cut when I was younger, 20 years ago, the fat. I didn't know that it existed. It was not yet described. And one patient was able to live 16 years, but with stuttering after my surgery. So once again, you have just to ask to the patient before, can you accept to have a slowness of articulation, maybe stuttering. Yes, I want to see my uh, uh, children growing, uh, please cut it. Perfect, I will do it. No, 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 no. Uh, I am uh, um, uh, in the marketing, I have to speak uh, uh, very uh, fluently, uh, please uh, don't cut it. Okay, I will not cut, cut it. You will tell me you will leave more tumor. Remember the fat will be compensated because running from uh, the SMA and the ventral premotor cortex, and then the SMA will be compensated finally by the contralateral hemisphere if you left a residue, and you will come back five to 10 years later to remove more tumor to have exactly the same results regarding the median survival or even better. And in the meantime, you know what? Your patient enjoyed perfect normal life. So my answer is it depends. Thank you, sir. There's another question from Dr. Ramirez of Colombia. What considerations do you have regarding the type of stimulation, monopolar versus bipolar, and frequency during brain mapping? I don't care. The most important is the cognitive monitoring. If the patient is still able to move, to speak, uh, to uh, to evaluate and so on, you're sure that everything is okay. And in the vast majority of meetings, the question is monopolar, uh, bipolar, um, indeed high frequency, uh, low frequency. I don't care. I was trained by George Hirschman. I have seen uh, 25 years ago in Seattle, 60 Hertz, like Penfield, bipolar, stimulating the ventral premotor cortex uh, in all cases. Okay, I understood, I will do it. I changed nothing for 25 years. And finally, so many papers dedicated to the electrophysiology. What I want is to see the results regarding the patient. And definitely, the mapping is, that, is for me just a confirmation in the end. As you have seen, I do not stimulate a lot because the most important is the cognitive monitoring. So you need to have very good neuropsychologist or neurologist or speech therapist, what you want. But if possible, PhD in cognitive neuroscience. My secret is that into the operating theater, we are all, except the anesthesiologist, I'm sorry about that, but PhD in cognitive neuroscience. Thank you, sir. There's another question that Dr. Aponte asks Does the fact of speaking more than one language give a better outcome? No, we published a paper, if you want, journal neurosurgery past year, and we uh, reported uh, um, translation 
in uh, 18 different languages, of course, not in the same patient, because I operate a lot, as I said, patients come in from abroad. And the results are more or less the same, at least regarding the return to normal life. And we uh, uh, based uh, our, our results on the return to work. And maybe just 5% less extensive resection when you have the translator into the OR because I am a little bit paranoid and uh, I have to stop earlier because I do not believe completely uh, on uh, uh, someone else uh, uh, when I am very close to the pathways. While in English or of course you're in French, of course, uh, I can do the monitoring by myself too, because of course I rely on a speech therapist and your psychologist, but uh, I listen online the patient. And finally, it's a potentiation for me because, okay, no problem, I can continue. Mm. Semantics, I know, I am not so far from the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex when the IFOF is running into this part and I have to stimulate, or and so on and so on. So in other words, you can use a translator. We had 18 different translator with more or less the same extent authorization and in all cases, return to normal life. Thank you, sir. There's a question from Dr. Ferrer. In addition to immunic molecular markers, you have another indicator or predictor to categorize a glioma as a slow growth glioma? You mean the beyond, I'm sorry, the beyond the? Beyond the, in addition to immuno, immunomolecular markers. No, immunomolecular, of course, the growth rate. Definitely, I calculate the first volume when you make the diagnosis, then I will do a second MRI before surgery, the day before surgery, and in the meantime, you had several weeks. It's not an emergency, so I'm only to operate low grade lymph. In the meantime, the patient should accept uh, uh, to be awake. And in the vast majority of cases, they are telling yes, but they have to be motivated to digest that and not just uh, to be passive. So answering the classical question in meeting, is it uh, so frequent for your patient to be motivated? Yes, in 99% of cases, because they have time to think about that. In the meantime, they have cognitive assessment, they have a fMRI, nonetheless, at least for research and so on. So you will calculate volumetric assessment on the first, second MRI, you will calculate the growth rate. And I will tell you a secret, this is more reliable and more predictive than the molecular pattern itself. Of course, it's just common sense. Once again, a tumor growing faster as a worse prognosis. So for me, this is the most important parameter. And of course, if a tumor is growing faster, I will take into consideration the molecular pattern to give postoperative chemotherapy alone or chemotherapy plus radiotherapy. But if a tumor is going slowly before surgery, you can tell me it's a wild time. If I did a complete resection according to the MRI, of course, I will say to the patient, you're not cured, but I will propose to the patient no adjuvant treatment. And I have many patients like this reported in journal near surgery. Thank you, sir. Just a question from Dr. Gupta from India. How is this cortical and subcortical mapping different from connectum near surgery? This is exactly the same thing. The problem is that the vast majority of neurosurgeons I know did only a cortical mapping. And they think that DTI is the function at the level of the white matter tract. And because there is a red white matter tract according to the preoperative DTI, this is the function. No, you have to map it. But beyond stimulation, once again, to monitor the cognitive functions by asking to a patient to, doing, to do many things simultaneously. It's not expensive. Many colleagues are telling me, ah, oh, you cannot do a semantic association task, auto-evaluation task, a mentalizing task movement, by manual coordination is too much. Why I cannot? Because the duration of surgery will be longer. No, it's shorter in my experience because the patient is doing everything simultaneously. So I can go very fast, as you have seen on movie, toward the functional connectome. 
And then I will finish the resection under general anesthesia once the lobe is disconnected. So it's another philosophy of surgery. It's not a technique, it's a philosophy. Thank you, sir. There's a question from Dr. I'll try to pronounce it well. Kai Boritso Sakul. He asks, for extensive bifrontal low grade glioma, what is just your resection strategy? It depends on the cognition before surgery. If the patient has a butterfly, glioblastoma can understand nothing during the first meeting. And uh, as a 70, I will do maybe a biopsy, but I will not operate. And I have read some papers telling you can operate. Of course I can. But what is the interest? Now you have a patient in front of you who is perfect. is not perfect according to the preoperative cognitive assessment, but enjoying a normal life. That means that brain plasticity compensated. So please start by a lobectomy in one side. Then the patient will have nonetheless a transitory deficit. Then you will do a postoperative cognitive rehabilitation. And then the patient will recover even better in comparison than before surgery. In the meantime, you will calculate once again the growth rate and you will have nonetheless also the neuropathological and molecular results. And then you will see the full picture. My protocol is that I have no protocol. I will adapt. If the tumor is growing faster, you have no reason to do another lobectomy. Otherwise, the patient will not have time in the contralateral hemisphere to compensate. So go to the chemotherapy. If the tumor is growing very slowly and the patient recovered, Okay, now we can consider to do a second surgery in the contralateral hemisphere because the brain compensated. So you will have selective patients and of course under awake mapping because more you will remove the contralateral homologous, more you will take risk to see a sudden break in the cognitive assessment. But if you have good neuropsychologist, finally, you will achieve this kind of uh, very impressive lobectomy with 99% of reliability in good patients. Thank you, sir. There's a question from Nishanth Sarashiva. Do you, custom, do you customize the psychological tests based on the hemispheres or do you do all the tests in both hemispheres surgery? Of course. There is no one area, one network, uh, just in one hemisphere. Bilateral repartition, and especially in patients with gliomas. As I told you, before to go to the operating theater, if the patient is well, that means that he compensated also thanks to an increase of the volume of the contralateral homologous, then an increase of the functional connectivity in the contralateral hemisphere, not only, but both. So you need to avoid any a priori by telling language left, movement right. Now, if you start to understand this concept of meta network, this concept of connectome, then you will stimulate accordingly, namely no a priori in the battery of tasks you will do into the operating theater, except according to the preoperative neurocognitive assessment, because if the patient started to have some decline of executive functions, that means that you, are, mm, you start to reach the limitation of neuroplasticity specifically regarding this domain. So you have to insist into the operating theater on this task, which was already disrupted before surgery and to do a specific rehabilitation accordingly. So you see that definitely stop to think about right, left. Thank you, sir. Uh, Keji Atiu asks a technical question for subfield dissection, which size soccer do you use? And do you reduce the suction power significantly? You will be uh, surprised, but I don't know uh, the diameter uh, because I can do more or less with a fork and a knife. You can give me what you want, I will do that. But I will regulate definitely with the thumb. And this is the reason why you need, I have probably an over representation uh, because I do that uh, with the left hand, even if I am right-handed, an over representation of my thumb in my homunculus. 
And of course, I have a network uh, dedicated to uh, probably um, feel the texture of the tumor, but also stimulate uh, stimul simultaneously at the level of the white matter tract and so on and so on. So definitely what means that if you use the CUSA, you have a risk to have a diffusion of the mechanical effect because you know that it's a distortion. So you increase the risk to have spasm. You increase also the risk to have a transitory disturbances induced by the CUSA itself into the contact of the Y matter tract. And so to stop earlier the resection for nothing, artifact. You do that with a succor, never I had spasm, never I induced due to the succor itself any perturbation, except if you start, of course, to be perpendicular to the white matter tract, and at this time, you will uh, induce a uh, um, movement of the tract, and, 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 and the patient will have a problem. Okay, I have understood, now I will stimulate. So learn to do it, and you will see that you can use this methodology for everything, including epilepsy surgery, because I have to be honest, I learned that from George Oshman in epilepsy. Thank you, sir. Uh, talking about that, there's a question from Dr. Gupta from India. Uh, he asks, what other fields of neurosurgery do you recommend connect on neurosurgery? In what other fields of neurosurgery would you recommend connect on neurosurgery? Yeah, surgery. As I said, high grade, low grade, metastasis, surgical approach to the ventricle, uh, to a deep uh, uh, cavernoma. Uh, if you have uh, a cavernoma in the so-called left dominant hemisphere, you have understood it does not exist, uh, but uh, very near the ventricle, you have to know that uh, you will cross at least uh, seven layers of white matter tract without any plasticity before, because not invaded by a tumor. So if you just uh, follow the uh, surgical approach according to the uh, your navigator, you have a risk to induce very important deficit. It's true for epilepsy surgery. Definitely, I learned from George, uh, who was an epileptic uh, and your surgeon. Uh, uh, you can also use it, uh, as I said, for BCI, brain computer interface, because to my opinion, the future of neurosurgery is restorative neurosurgery. How do you want to restore the brain if we have not understood the connectome? I continue to see sometimes paper with a beautiful technology, beautiful engineer, in BCI, but they put just one probe at the level of the primary motor cortex. They understood nothing. There is a network. So they have to put probes everywhere in order to resynchronize the network. So you see that brain connectome, if neurosurgeons are not able to deal with it, to my opinion, I'm sorry, they have to put screw in the spine. Okay, sir. So there's another question. Uh, do you think you will ever attempt memory task in trial? It depends because uh, in the vast majority of cases, uh, we speak about uh, or working memory, so short-term memory with manipulation of items. And yes, you can use uh, the end back task, for instance, uh, to name not the picture in front of you now, but the picture which was uh, uh, presented to you, to the patient, just before, so it's not a cat now, it was a dog. If we are speaking about the long-term memory, in the vast majority of cases, it's related to the fact that there is an involvement of the mesiotemporal structures. So definitely, if the patient has a glioma at this level and a fortiori seizures, I will not map the long-term memory because I know that I will remove the mesial temporal structures because I need to do it in order to control seizures. And more you will control seizures, thanks to post-operative rehabilitation, and more you will remove tumor, of course, in order to give the opportunity for the patient to live longer, and more you will see a re-increase of uh, uh, the memory functions, especially thanks to the contralateral hemisphere, but also related to the executive functions themselves because no seizures anymore and decrease of anti-epileptic drugs. So that means that in this specific mesiotemporal glioma, no, I will not map memory. Thank you, sir. I think that's all the questions. So on behalf of Sien, 
I'd like to thank you again, Professor Defoe. Uh, it has been a wonderful lecture. And uh, for all the audience, um, we're, really, we're really grateful, Dr. Defoe, and honored for your participation in the 2021 IWBNC. And um, for all the audience, keep in mind this lecture will be available on our website starting next week. Uh, in a few minutes, we will have Dr. Peter Schwartz doing his lecture endoscopic resection of anterior skull based meningiomas. Uh, to get uh, the link for this upcoming conference, please follow the link PM on the chat uh, or check the program schedule on our website, cnus.com. Thank you very much, Dr. Rifo. Many I really, thanks. I, I really enjoyed your conference and I think all the audience was uh, amazed with your conference. Greetings from uh, Montpellier. Goodbye. Merci, monsieur. Bonjour.